HPLC is considered to be the world's most popular analytical tool, yet very few people understand how it works. They expect this to be complicated because, let's face it, there's some complicated stuff going on. It's mechanically complicated and also chemically. Now, the mechanical stuff I've already covered in the operations video. You want to check that out if you want to see the nuts and bolts of the HPLC. But now let's talk about the chemistry. We're going to talk about the thing that most people consider to be unattainable in, term, in terms of understanding, but I'm going to prove to you that you could understand this separation. So first, we talk about chromatography as a separation tool. We're going to inject a mixture and we're going to separate the individual components. So we ask the question, how does separation occur? Well, it's all a function of how much the analyte likes the stationary phase versus the mobile phase. Now, you've probably heard my analogies of the shopping mall. The shopping mall involves uh, me going to a, a mall with my sister. The mall is filled with a bunch of fashion stores. So we, as we go through the mall, we're in the moving sidewalk and it's transporting us through the mall. If we like the store, we get off the sidewalk, spend time in the store. So the first store is a dress store. My sister spends time. I keep moving. She comes out. I'm 100 feet in front of her. Next door is an accessory store. Hats and gloves and purses. She goes in and spends time. I keep moving. Now I'm 200 feet in front of her. Finally, we come up to a shoe store. She goes in. Um, we call this irreversible adsorption because she goes in and, and never seems to come out. So at the end of that mall, who's going to come off first? Who's going to be standing there looking at their watch waiting? Well, I'm going to come off first because I have very little affinity for the stores inside the mall. The same thing happens in HPLC. The analytes move through a column. If they like the stationary phase, they'll stick. If they don't like the stationary phase, they'll keep moving. So that's the basis of separation in HPLC and GC. But HPLC, we have another layer. And that other layer makes it more complicated, but makes it a lot more versatile. And that is the mobile phase itself. Back to my shop mall analogy, you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit. And in this case, the moving sidewalk has its own attraction, has its own affinity. And maybe that moving sidewalk is really nice and you want to be there and maybe it's terrible. Uh, you don't want to be there. We do have what we call repulsive mechanisms in HPLC where we make the mobile phase so repulsive that we force the analytes on the column. They really don't want to be there, but they'd rather be there instead of in this terrible mobile phase. So in LC, the moving sidewalk itself has its own attraction. So now we ask the question, not how much does someone like each store in the mall, but how much does someone like each store compared to the moving sidewalk? So here's uh, my analogy for HPLC. We go to the shopping mall. This time the shopping mall is here in, in Chicago. It's the middle of the winter and the power is out. So the heat is off, it's freezing cold, it's dark, it's dusty inside the main part of the mall where the moving sidewalk is, but or all of the stores have heat. So the first store is a dress store and you have a choice. Do you wanna freeze to death in this mall or do you want to spend time in that store staying warm? So at this point, everyone in the mall is going to go into that first store, that dress store. And you can imagine the people walking around the store have different affinities. Some are there just to stay warm. I'm never going to buy a dress. Some are there who are looking for dresses. They're shopping today, but they're not going to buy one. And someone is there who's going to a prom tonight and they're not leaving until they buy their dress. So you get the idea we have different levels of affinity. So then an announcement comes over the loudspeaker and it announces that the heat is fixed, the lights are on, so feel free to walk through the mall, the moving sidewalk is now nice and warm. So what's gonna happen? Some people who didn't really wanna be in that store to begin with, maybe myself included, we're gonna leave that store and we're gonna enter the nice warm mall because we had a choice. Do we wanna go shopping for dresses? Do we wanna stay warm? We'd rather stay warm. So then 10 minutes later, another announcement comes out of the loudspeaker and this says, uh, to make up for the fact that we had no heat this morning, we're gonna offer free lunch, free pizza and beer to anyone standing on the moving sidewalk right now. So now imagining, imagine you're in the dress store and you're interested in dresses, but you're more hungry than you are interested in dresses. At that point, you're gonna leave the store and go enjoy the free lunch. Now, some people have a higher affinity for dresses that uh, that, that person is going to their prom tonight. They're gonna to stay there until they, until they get their dress, but you can imagine more people have now left the store and go into the mall, into that is the mobile phase. Um, and then another announcement comes over the loudspeaker that says, we're gonna offer a free gold coin, $3,000 worth of gold to anyone who stands on the moving sidewalk right now. At that point, almost everyone's gonna leave the store and enter the moving sidewalk. Um, so what I just described there is a gradient in HPLC. That means we start with a very weak mobile phase, right? We have mobile phase and stationary phase. The stationary phase holds on to all the analytes. The mobile phase is very weak. It doesn't compete very much. And then as the mobile phase gets stronger, it's a stronger competitor and it draws more things off the column. So in GC, we have separation based on one thing, 
r the relative affinity to the stationary phase. In LC, we have two things, how much they like the stationary phase versus how much they like the mobile phase. So we can change now in two dimensions. I talk about GC is like driving a car, LC is like flying a jet. So let me teach you how to fly a jet. Let me explain how the separation works. For this to, to work, I'm gonna explain the most complicated thing in, uh, in the analytical chemistry world, and that is the chemistry behind HPLC. But to do it, we're gonna have a little bit of fun and we're gonna need a little bit of help. We're getting uh, some help from our friend uh, uh, Kool-Aid. And this is grape Kool-Aid. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna separate the various colored components from grape Kool-Aid. So you probably all know what this is. You've played with this before. When you're a kid, you get to drink this stuff. And um, let me just start off by saying there's nothing natural in here. This is artificially flavored and artificially colored. Uh, hopefully I didn't burst anyone's bubble by telling you that, that there's no grape juice in here. There's chemicals that are mixed together to look like grape juice and taste like grape juice. So if there are colored chemicals in here, we should be able to separate them by chromatography. So the first question is what color is grape Kool-Aid? And the answer? It's purple. Some people say grape, grape's a flavor, purple's a color, let's establish that. So it is purple. And it turns out in the United States, there's only six colors you can add to food. Purple is not one of them. So either this is illegal Kool-Aid or it must contain a blend of colors that make it appear to be purple. So let's go out and separate those various colored components from grape Kool-Aid. To do that, we're gonna use a liquid chromatography column. And uh, what I'm using here is a solid phase extraction cartridge. And you see these in use a lot in, uh, in sample prep. In fact, it's one of my favorite sample prep approaches. Uh, this little cartridge allows us to do a pre-separation. So uh, we can remove the matrix and keep the analytes. We can remove the analytes and keep the matrix and, uh, and uh, anything we want in this cool little cartridge. But this cartridge is a fully functional HPLC uh, column. Now, it's a small column and it's packed with really large particles. And if you've sat through my LC theory video, you know that the smaller the particle, the better. In this case, I've got big particles, 40 micron. So this is not super high efficiency, but this is great to do simple separations. So um, let me explain the chemistry. This is the part that people expect to be complicated, but bear with me here. I think you're gonna find out that this is really understandable. So this cartridge is a C18, that is the most popular mobile phase, uh, I'm sorry, stationary phase in all of HPLC, a C18 stationary phase, which means it's 18 carbons. It's a very non-polar material. So let me explain polarity. Polarity is very important in chromatography. We use the term, we use it in chemistry. It's probably the most important term in biochemistry, yet professors may take two years to explain polarity because they have to talk about electron orbital theory and electron density and that kind of stuff. I'm gonna give you a two minute version of polarity. You ready for this? Water is polar. Anything dissolved in water must be polar. We say like dissolves like. So if something dissolves in water, it is polar. If something does not dissolve in water, it is nonpolar. There we go. That's all you need to know about polarity. I know I can hear you laughing out there, but let me, we're gonna give you a little quiz and see if you really understand this. Um, in the kitchen over there, I have some sugar, some table sugar. What do you think? Is that polar or nonpolar? It's polar. How do you know? It dissolves in water. I got some table salt over there. What do you think? Sodium chloride, polar or nonpolar? It's polar, how do you know? It dissolves in water. How about, um, I got some olive oil. I like to use for salad dressing. Olive oil, what do you think, polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar, how do you know? It does not dissolve in water. So that is the world of polarity. If it's water soluble, it's polar. Not water soluble, it's nonpolar. And then of course we have, you know, uh, 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 gradations of that in between. So this stationary phase is a C18. It's very, very nonpolar. The mobile phase, we're gonna start off with is water. It's very, very polar. So the molecules have a choice. Do you wanna hang out with the polar mobile phase or the non-polar stationary phase? Okay, so this column uh, has been equilibrated. So I've been equilibrating this with water. And when we study HPLC, we're going to learn uh, how important it is to do equilibrations. Uh, it takes five column volumes. You learned that in my other videos. But in this case, I've been passing water through here and I'm uh, pretty sure that it is now in equilibrium. So in other words, there's water moving through, there's a stationary phase in there, it's a C18. And now I could introduce my sample. My sample is grape Kool-Aid and I made it up just like the instructions say. So in, in this case, um, this grape Kool-Aid is going to go through the cartridge and remember the colors 
they have a choice. They can stick to the non-polar cartridge or they can elute in the polar mobile phase. So at this point, I want you to make an observation. I'm about a third of the way through this syringe of Kool-Aid and the colored compounds, what have they chosen? Have they chosen the non-polar stationary phase? Are they stuck to the cartridge or are they eluding in the polar mobile phase? Do you see purple drops coming out? And the answer is, yeah, they've stuck to the stationary phase. So tell me something about these colored compounds. Are they relatively polar or relatively nonpolar? Considering the fact that they're stuck onto a nonpolar stationary phase, your answer? Yeah, they're nonpolar. Um, how do I know that? Well, look, they're not coming off in the water, they're sticking onto the cartridge. So um, with water as my mobile phase, these analytes have chosen the C18, no question at all, they love C18. But I've got to get the molecules off the cartridge as well. So if water has no hydrophobicity and methanol has a lot, ethanol has a lot, I'm going to go to a blend of ethanol, and this is 10% ethanol. And what I'm going to do here is, as I start to push this through the cartridge, again, I give the colored compounds a choice. Do you guys want to stick to the non-polar C18 stationary phase, or do you want to start to loot in the 10% ethanol? Well, when I give the molecules a choice of water versus C18, all the molecules chose C18. But at this point, you can make an observation. My first question is, how many colored compounds are in grape Kool-Aid? Um, and the answer is at least two. And what are those two colors? Uh, red and blue. Remember what you learned in kindergarten? Red and blue make purple. Yeah, you learned something important in kindergarten. Okay, so now we're at a point where um, the red is coming close to coming off, so I'm going to switch containers here. Pardon me. I'll come back here, and now what you can see is I am eluding off the red chemical. So of these two chemicals, the red versus the blue, which one is more nonpolar? Which one is more hydrophobic? Uh, and the answer is the blue is more hydrophobic. How do we know that? Because it's stuck further onto the cartridge. Um, it doesn't want to let go. So we have this term polar, nonpolar. In chemistry, we, we like the terms hydrophobicity. Hydrophobic is nonpolar, right? afraid of water. Hydrophilic is polar, it loves water. So at this point, we're seeing that the red is more hydrophilic than the blue because the blue is stuck to the C18 cartridge. This is wonderful. So we're seeing these separation occur before our eyes, but that blue stuff is, uh, it's pretty stubborn. It's pretty nonpolar. It doesn't want to leave the cartridge. So instead of 10% ethanol, I went from 0% ethanol to 10%. Let's go up to 75.5%. Why 75.5? Well, uh, this is a food grade experiment. This is, uh, anyone who knows how to convert percent to proof, this is 151 proof. Yeah, this would be Bacardi 151. So, as I start to push this through the cartridge, what you're seeing is the blue will start to move. So clearly the red is moving easily and quickly like it was before, but this time we're seeing the blue begin to move. So this was a gradient in HPLC. I started with 10%, then I stepped to uh, uh, 75 percent, 75 and a half percent in order to loot the two different compounds. So with a little bit of luck, I could collect pure red in one and I'll switch. <laughs> yeah, you can tell what happened. I dropped one. Okay, here we are. We're back and I'll switch this to the blue. I don't know. It's a little harder for me to do. Oops. So as you could tell, I've now separated the various components of grape Kool-Aid. Uh, so if I reach back over here, we now have uh, three containers. The first one is polar, the second one is semipolar, and the third one is nonpolar. Now I know what, what everyone's thinking, well there's nothing in the polar one, I can't see anything. Well just because you can't see it doesn't mean there's nothing there. Um, uh, I don't recommend you drink anything in the laboratory, but being an experimentalist, at some point, you know, I had to, I had to drink this up. This is really sour. This is the polar stuff they put in Kool-Aid, the citric acid, the, the, the tart stuff that makes it sour. 
Uh, if there were sugar in here, this would be sour and sweet because the sugar is very polar. Now, of the other two fractions, if you take a little sniff of each one, I know you can't smell this, but boy, this one really smells like grape. I mean, it smells like concentrated grape flavor. So the grape flavor ended up in the blue container. Now, it's a coincidence. The blue chemical is not grape flavored. I really have no idea what they use for artificial grape flavoring, but I know this, it's pretty nonpolar. How do I know that? It showed up in the nonpolar fraction. So in real life, I've used this exact same thing to uh, tackle the million dollar problems. It goes something like this. We just made 10,000 pounds of stuff and it smells bad. And it's not supposed to smell bad. We can't sell it to the customer. Why does it smell bad? We fractionate polar, semi-polar, non-polar. See which one smells. Ooh, non-polar smells. Run that by GCMS back. There's your, uh, there's your smelly compounds. So uh, I used solid phase extraction in order to demonstrate chromatography. That's real chromatography. There's no tricks or party tricks in that. That's real chemistry. So what you're visualizing there is what's happening inside the HPLC. The chemistry is identical. So here is my $75,000 version and here's my $5 version. Same chemistry. I have a C18 cartridge in there, C18 column. I have methanol water up top that I'm using for my, my mobile phases. And in this case, instead of using my thumb uh, to drive the solvent, well, my thumb's pretty good but it's not good enough to pump 9,000 PSI. That's why I need the expensive pump. Now that I have a nice constant flow going through the pump, well, I can introduce a flow through detector to monitor the colors, the compounds coming off, exactly monitoring, not just that they're coming off, but their exact concentrations. And I have my auto sampler to inject the exact same amount of sample every single time. And then my column oven to keep the column at constant temperature. So all we're doing is we're taking this simple concept uh, and just mechanizing it to look like it's really complicated. So that is the world of HPLC chemistry. That's supposed to be the most complicated thing out there. And hopefully you'll agree with me that, gosh, I totally understood the great uh, Kool-Aid experiment. That is HPLC. So if you want to learn more about HPLC, catch the other videos on the operation of the nuts and bolts um, and uh, check out the rest of our videos or come visit us here at Axion Labs. We'll see you the next time.